I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is going to be our text today. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app with you, that is fine. Just grab one of the few Bibles around you. They look just like this and turn to page 1125 and you will find our text for the day. Hey, by the way, happy Easter. Uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, and, and I apologize for the crowding uh, and, uh, and glad that you endured it. I'm glad you endured the parking and uh, there's still people looking for places to sit. So if you got something around, you might want to scoot in just a little bit. But uh, I'm glad you endured it. But uh, here's, the, here's the good news. Uh, you know, maybe next year, well, it might be this crowded, but it will be in a different location uh, because uh, they finally gave us a date for our Sweetwater Worship Center dedication. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, we're building a new building so that we have more seats and more parking and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and the date's not when I wanted it to be, but that's been the case for about the last four months. And, uh, but here's the thing, on May 14th, 15th, we're going to dedicate our new sanctuary. So, uh, you know, you can come then, you can come every week before then, because we don't mind being a little bit crowded, and uh, we'll have more space. And maybe next Easter, it'll have a little bit more room, but uh, then again, maybe not. So, because uh, we're okay with that too. But uh, we're glad you're here. How, by the way, how many of you like surprises? Okay, a lot of hands go up. A lot of people are like, ah, maybe, depends on the surprise, right? So let me put it another way. How many of you uh, would love it if somebody threw a surprise party for you? Okay, a lot of hands go up. Uh, how many of you would hate it if somebody threw a surprise party for you? Yeah, more hands go up. <laughs> So I have this theory that the people who love surprise parties marry the people who hate them, and it becomes an issue in their marriage their whole rest of their life. Uh, so if, that, if you guys were you know, together and you both raised hands at different times, uh, figure out how to bless each other. It'll, uh, it'll save you a lot of pain. Seven years ago, for our 25th wedding anniversary, I decided to surprise my wife, Merelda, with a trip. And uh, I took her to Vegas. She didn't know where we were going. And I went to Vegas because that's where we went on my honeymoon, on our honeymoon. And uh, just to put it really bluntly, um, uh, our honeymoon was a fail. Uh, I mean, it just didn't work all that well. Things didn't happen the way we were poor. We didn't have much money. And, uh, and so uh, I said, hey, let's go back. And I'm going to make it right this time. We're going we're gonna to do it all up. And I'm going to plan a week full of surprises for her. And she liked most of them. Now hold that thought just for a few minutes, because today as we celebrate Easter, I want you to know that God loves to surprise his people. God loves to surprise his people. So if you are one of God's people, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I want you to know that God loves to surprise you. And so you should live your life expecting God to surprise you. Now, why do I say that? That's because the Bible is full of stories of God surprising his people. And that's why we encourage you to read it. You can find these things that God did. and He's going to do stuff like that in the future, too. And, and so here's the thing. He, he loves to surprise his people. For instance, uh, some of you have heard of this guy named Moses. And Moses uh, was asked by God to take his people out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. He said, I want you to go and lead them to freedom. And so Moses did that. And, and if you're not familiar with the story, there's this movie made in the 60s called The Ten, called the Ten Commandments. Charlton Heston, really good movie. You ought, to, you ought to check it out sometime. So Moses led them out of Egypt. And they got to the point where on one side of them was this body of water called the Red Sea. And the other side of them was the Egyptian army that was coming after them. And they thought they were going to be destroyed because they were were trapped. And, and in the midst of their, their dilemma, guess what God did? He parted the Red Sea. I, I mean, nobody saw that coming. I mean, we knew it because we read the book and we you know, saw the movie and everything, but none of them that knew it was coming. That was just total surprise. Like, what are we going to do? What's God going to do? And whoosh, the water goes apart and it goes, walk this way. Yeah. Or maybe you've heard of this uh, David and Goliath story. Right? Also in the Old Testament, book of 2 Samuel. And, and, uh, and if you just heard that in the sports reference, there was actual a story that involved these two guys named David and Goliath. And so what happened was the Philistine army and the Israelite army are facing off each other, but no one's really attacking. But every day, Goliath, 
who is the champion of the Philistine army. I mean, he's a giant among men, a warrior of warriors. He would come out on the battlefield and, and he would throw down a challenge and he'd say, hey, I want the best warrior from Israel to come fight me in a winner-take-all battle. Just the two of us, mano a mano. And nobody from Israel would go. They were all chicken. Until one day, this kid showed up. He's literally a teenager, uh, you know, a shepherd boy named David. And he goes, hey, uh, I hear this guy challenging Israel. Who's going to go out there and kill him? Because he's blaspheming our God. And everybody goes, right, we're not going. So David goes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go out there and fight him. And, and so he went out there with a, a sling and a stone, and he killed a giant. Nobody expected him to survive. Or maybe you heard about this girl named Mary. Right? Just a young girl pledged to be married to a guy named Joseph. And one day an angel shows up and says, Mary, God has chosen you and you're going to be the mother of Messiah. And she's like, that can't happen because I don't know if you know my story, but I'm a virgin and I've never known a man. And so uh, I can't get pregnant. And, and the angel told her, don't worry. God's the one who made the rules. He can break the rules. Okay. <laughs> Nothing's impossible with God. So God loves to surprise his people. And Easter is God's very best surprise. Easter is God's best surprise. The, the passage we're looking at today, Luke chapter 24, uh, we're going to begin at verse 1. Uh, I, some of you have read this many times, and some of you have never heard this at all. Uh, listen to this, follow along in your Bibles to this with uh, looking for those surprises, looking for those things that people weren't expecting to have happen. Now, just to set the stage, Friday, Jesus was crucified. He was buried. Uh, Saturday's passed. This is Sunday morning, the first day of the week, where we pick up in Luke 24. It says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with, uh, with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. You know, Easter is God's best surprise. Did you, did you catch all the surprises in the story? First of all, they went to the tomb, and it was sealed with a stone, and the stone was moved. And then they went inside the tomb, and the body wasn't there. And then while they were trying to figure out who stole the body, a couple of angels show up. Surprise! And tell him, he's not here, he's risen. And then they run back and tell the others, and they don't believe them because they think they're crazy. It's full of surprises. But look at the big picture. They were broken. They were hopeless. They were despairing. And surprise, Jesus is alive. And they believed that Jesus had been defeated, but God was claiming victory. And they thought their lives were forever shattered. And suddenly, God changed their lives in a way they never imagined. They, they had given up all hope and suddenly their lives are filled with hope and life and joy because Easter is God's best surprise. But if we're honest, if we're really honest, we don't always appreciate God's surprises. We, we, it's not so much the surprise as it is the process of getting to the surprise, right? Look at the story. The, the disciples, the women, they, they were crushed, surprised, horrified, shocked when Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And he was arrested and he was condemned and he was executed and, and their life was shattered. They were stunned by that surprise. And it was a heartbreaking, pain-filled, life-shattering journey. But understand, God was getting them ready for the surprise. 
God was setting them up for the very best surprise of all, Easter. Now, I want to go back to my anniversary story because the crowning event on my week in Vegas was a surprise wedding renewal for my wife and I. We were going to do the whole vows thing again. And so I invited family and friends and, and told them where the venue was and said, meet us there. And, uh, but I had to have a ruse, right? Because you have to you know, have a story to get the person to the surprise. And, and so I told my wife, we're going to go see Phantom of the Opera because she loves that show. And so we got to get all dressed up for it because we're going to the theater, you know. And uh, so we got dressed up and, and we get in the car and I said, oh, by the way, on the way there, we have to stop at this church uh, because I got to pick something up for Calvary. And she got a little bit irritated because we're on vacation and I'm going to work. I was like, okay, I can live with a little bit of irritation. So we get in the car, and we're starting to drive on our way there. And surprise to me, we hit a traffic jam. And so now, as we're inching along the highway, she is stewing because she thinks we're going to be late. Right? We should just forget about the, the going by the church. No, we can't forget about it because I can't tell her that's where the real thing's happening. Right? But as the moments drift by, she gets angrier and angrier at me. I mean, she was to the point where if the car had stopped, she would have gotten out and walked away. Some of you have been there, haven't you? So we finally pull into the church, and we're there, and uh, she, she goes, I'm not getting out of the car. <laughs> you know, this whole surprise doesn't work if she stays in the car. So I put 25 years of marriage on the line, and I said, trust me, and get out of the car. <laughs> so she did, fine, boom. She not holding my hand walking in there. <laughs> so we walk through the doors, and she sees our daughters, and she goes from like, you know, being irate to being puzzled. And then she sees her mom and dad and understands what is going on, and she goes from puzzled to a puddle of tears. <laughs> and then, of course, a few minutes later, when we did the vow renewal, she said yes again. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, it was a good gamble there. Uh, anyway, it's a nice story, and some of you are going, okay, that's nice. What's the point? What's the point of that? Uh, your life today may not be exactly where you want it to be. I mean, you may be broken, you may be hurting, you may be grieving or recovering, you may be an addict, you may be alone, afraid, unemployed, hopeless. But if you are a follower of Jesus, understand you are on the way to a surprise. Okay, You're on the way to a surprise and you're probably not enjoying the journey right now. You might even be really angry at God for what you're going through, what you're experiencing. But don't give up because God is getting you ready for a tremendous surprise. You might need to be patient. You might need to endure. You might need to listen to God and trust him and get out of the car. <laughs> but God loves to surprise his people and God wants to surprise you today. God wants to surprise you right now. Uh, let me just tell you a few of the things he wants to surprise you with. There's a lot of things he could do, but let me just tell you what I know he wants to surprise you with. He wants to surprise you with love, not anger. The Apostle John said, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loves us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God loves you. I want you to hear this. God loves you. God isn't angry at you, even if your life is a mess. By the way, everyone in this room, our lives are a mess. We, we're all rebellious. We're, we're all disobedient. And, and even if you're actively being disobedient right now, God still loves you like crazy. You see, he grieves your self-destruction and your pain. And that's why he was willing to let Jesus suffer and die to redeem your brokenness. So today, God wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that he is for you. He wants you to know that he wants to bless your life. 
if you'll just receive his love. If you'll understand that, that, that he's not angry at you and he wants to pour his love into your life. And that begins when we say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to be yours and, and I want you to fill my life with your love. So I pray today that you are surprised by God's amazing love. I pray that you leave here knowing that you are loved and you are treasured by God. And God wants to surprise us with mercy, not judgment. Again, the Apostle John says this. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What an amazing promise. Now, if we're really honest, some of us feel guilty when we come to church. In fact, some people avoid church because they feel guilty. Because they think that uh, if I go to church, I'm just going to get condemned and judged uh, probably by God and probably by God's people too. But God's desire is to forgive, not to condemn. And I know this because Jesus himself said so. Uh, a lot of you know the verse John 3.16, or if you don't know the verse, you've seen people holding up signs that say John 3.16 at football games and stuff like that. At John 3.16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. And you go, great, if I believe in Jesus, I have eternal life. That is awesome. But the verse goes on, verse 17, not many people, even even. Avid churchgoers don't often know 17. Jesus continued and said, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. Did you catch that? God didn't send Jesus into this world to condemn us. He sent him in here to save us, to rescue us, to give us life and hope. So if you've been thinking that God is condemning you and he's just you know, waiting to blast you with thunderbolts every time you mess up, you need to think again. Jesus died to forgive us of all our sins, which means that Jesus died to forgive you. It's personal. He wants to forgive you of all your sin. But it starts when we confess, when we admit. And some of you are going, yeah, but I've done some really bad things. Yeah, you know what? God knows. He was there. He saw it. And he still wants to forgive you. And you might think, well, I don't deserve it. No, you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it either. That's why it's called amazing grace. You see, so I pray today that God surprises you with his mercy. That you leave here knowing that you are forgiven and you are loved. And finally, I think God wants to surprise us with freedom, not rules. Jesus said, if the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, I know some of you are going, freedom and church? I mean, come on, that's, that can't be. I mean, because isn't God and church all about rules and doing the right things and stuff? After all, didn't God inspire that movie you mentioned earlier, you know, the Ten Commandments? Yeah, God gave us the Ten Commandments. But, but all of God's commands are to protect us from pain, not to keep us from experiencing the good things. Um, well, how many of you are ever children? Yeah, I don't know if you can still remember it, but when you were young, didn't your parents tell you not to run into the street without stopping and looking? Didn't they tell you that? Is that because they wanted to keep you from the joys of the street? No, it's because they didn't want you to get run over by a car. You know? Or what about this? Did they ever tell you not to touch the hot stove? How many of you touched it anyway? Yeah, there's some in every service. You got the scars to prove it. She only did it once because they weren't trying to deprive you of some pleasurable experience. They're trying to protect you from the pain uh, of your rebellion. Um, you guys have pets? Anybody, anybody got pets? Dogs, cats, whatever else lives in your house? I've noticed because I'm a dog owner that, that my dog deposits little, you know, uh, piles of stuff in my backyard. <laughs> right? And, and your dog probably does the same thing too. If you have a cat, you've got that, you know, nice little litter box in there. Uh, do you guys... Um, Tell your kids, you know, when they're, you know, little, not, or your grandkids, not to play with the little brown piles in the backyard? <laughs> Do you tell them that, that that is not a sandbox and those are not little buried treasures to find <laughs> in there? Do you guys do that because you're all about rules and you want to deprive them of some joy? No, you want to keep them from, you know, being disgusting and destroying themselves and getting germs. It's, it's gross. You know, if that's true with us, 
That's true with God. See, God loves us, and he wants to protect us from pain, from our our tendency for self-destruction. And yes, it's true that some churches and pastors love to create extra rules to try and control people, but that's not God. That's definitely not Calvary. In fact, Jesus said that the Ten Commandments could be summarized in just two statements. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two verses, these two statements, these two commands. You see, God wants to set us free, free to live a life of love, free to to live joyfully, free to serve others, free to be able to forgive. And God wants to set us free from our addictions, from our despair, from our hopelessness, even from our boredom. I pray today that you are surprised by God's offer of freedom. You see, ultimately, God wants to surprise you with a new life. A new life. The Apostle Paul put it this way. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. And we get this new life by following Jesus. We get this life because it's made possible by the wonderful Easter surprise. So has God surprised you today? Has he he met you here and, and visited his love or his mercy or his freedom upon you? Do you you have that sense, uh, like maybe you didn't have when you came in, that that God's been speaking to you and wants you to follow him? Uh, Let me give you a a couple of next steps, because it's really easy to kind of come to church and go, wow, that felt good, but what do I do now? Let me just give you a couple of what do I do now. If you're here and you've really never, you know, decided to follow Jesus and you think you want to do that, At the end of the service, there's going to be some members of our prayer team here across the front. And they would love to talk with you, pray with you, uh, just about how Christ can can lead your life. I mean, they'll pray with you about anything, but but they'd love to talk to you, especially about that. Or if you don't want to talk to them, come find one of the pastors and just say, hey, I want to begin this journey with Jesus. Or, Or maybe you're here and you're a follower of Christ and you know that, but you've never been baptized. You've never publicly declared your faith in the way that God asked us to, and, and, and you've, you're just sensing God saying, hey, you need to do that. Then grab one of those connection cards, put your information on it, and just go, I want to be baptized. Someone will call you this week, and we'll figure out when we can baptize you so that you can be obedient to Christ. Or maybe you're sitting here going, okay, I know Jesus, and I've been baptized, but I'm just kind of stuck where I am, and I need God to change my life. Well, then let me encourage you to connect. Take that step of connection uh, because life change happens in the context of relationships. And and, uh, we've got lots of ways to connect. Next weekend, in fact, you can come, if you come next weekend, you can sign up for life groups. Life groups are small groups of of people who get together and study God's word and encourage each other and pray for each other and and just help you to follow Jesus better. Uh, we've also got uh, a thing called Celebrate Recovery that meets on Monday nights. If you've, you're kind of stuck in some habits that are destroying your life, it's a way to get unstuck. I encourage you to come check it out. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're going, I just don't know enough about this Jesus thing to really go in a group of any kind. Uh, I need to learn more. Great. In May, we're kicking off a class called Alpha. Alpha is just for people who don't know anything about God, anything about Christianity, anything about the Bible. And, and if you want to learn, then come to that. What I'm saying is this, Jesus is offering to change your life. He will surprise you with how he will change your life. Are you ready to take him up on that offer? Because he will make all things new. Let's pray.